Hello, coffee listeners. This is Kelly again, but I'm not in Brazil. Yes, I am traveling a lot and I'm searching for different views about Brazilian coffee, quality, specialty, and why not commercial coffee as well. Your podcast with a little bit of Brazilian coffee. Café. Before we start this episode, I would like to talk to you, our international audience, in this section that I like to call as Espresso Moment. I decided long ago to produce episodes in English, despite my accent and eventual grammatical mistakes for a very noble reason. It is time for us, the Brazilian coffee professionals, take ownership of our narrative and tell our own story. For this reason, most of the episodes in English present information about Brazilian coffee from very different perspectives, since the producing areas until the buyers. We already recorded several episodes dispelling stereotypes about coffee in Brazil. For example, there is an interesting interview with Valentina Moxonova from Russia. She decided, believe it or not, to invest in Brazilian high-quality conilon. Yes, you listen right. If you didn't listen to this episode, please check it out at Spotify or in our website. Recording podcasts in English was my first bold step in showing the world the realities of the Brazilian coffee business. I spent a lot of time imagining how to tell our coffee stories in a very effective and immersive way, until a great idea hit me. Why not bring in people to different Brazilian producing regions so they can learn from their own experience? From this realization, Coffee Trips, a sister company of this podcast, was born this year with the goal of sharing first-hand coffee experiences directly with coffee enthusiasts and coffee professionals everywhere. So why not hit the road and see Brazilian coffee culture for yourself? This is more than just experience Brazilian coffee products. You will be able to connect with the people who are producing your coffee directly. It's not me telling their story. You'll be there. If coffee is made by people for people, therefore, it is important to understand the human relationships that permeate our coffee culture. And I'm glad to tell you that we already have interesting tours organized for next harvest in five different Brazilian states. Espírito Santo, Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, Minas Gerais, and Bahia. Please check our website www.coffeatrips.com.br and send us a message if you want to have an amazing, safe experience in some of the many coffee producing regions in Brazil. You can also send us an email to contato, C O N T A T O at coffeeattrips.com.br. This project will help us to be more effective in telling our stories and also this will be an extra income for small producers in the country. Now that you know that you can schedule your next trip to Brazil with Coffee Trips, let's get back to our guest. I'm collecting different opinions and experiences from different international buyers about our coffee and Rob from Olam has great insights to share with you in this episode. So today I'm the headquarters of Olam Specialty Coffee with the general manager, Rob Steven. Welcome, Rob. Hi, nice to be here. So first of all, this episode is towards to give a perspective, a honest, so you can say what you think and what you saw during these years about Brazilian coffee. Be for starters, first thing first, would you be kind and introduce yourself, your experience with coffee, how it started, when? Sure. Uh, I'll try and be brief. Uh, my name is Rob Steven. I'm general manager here at Olam Specialty Coffee in Providence, Rhode Island. I have been in coffee about 30 years and uh, started in a coffee shop a long, long time ago. Uh, just very young. Very young, just as a job <laughs> while I was a musician. Uh, and uh, one day they took me to the roasting plant to do a training and I met the coffee buyer and said, wow, I really want to do that with my life. And it changed my whole track. And since then... So your I've... first experience was a barista? Yes. Oh. Yeah. It's not a path that most people follow, but uh, it's the path that I followed. So uh, found out that it had uh, travel, it had uh, business and finance, it had uh, sensory and artistry.
citizenship to it and uh, worked with a lot of people and a lot of international culture and just everything that I wanted. So from there, I went on to work in roasting and learned how to roast and worked for Pete's Coffee for a while as one of their roasters. And uh, then I went to the, uh, I ran my own business for a while, worked for Dunkin' Donuts as their director of coffee for a while, and then got into the green side about 10, 12 years ago and have been on the import side ever since. So for those who don't know, because our listeners, they are not only coffee professionals, there are lots of coffee curious. Would you explain what Olam does, how big it is, just to give an idea? Sure. Yeah. Olam is, is, a, is quite a large company, actually. It's an agricultural company, so it's, it's not just a coffee company. It's a company that specializes in food products and commodities. Uh, across multiple different types of foods, so spices and nuts and coffee and, and cocoa and cotton and all sorts of things like that. And we're in about 80 countries and we have close to 40,000 people working for us. But within each of those types of food products, we have different uh, divisions, different, uh, you know, so, so we have a commercial coffee division and we have a specialty coffee division, which is where I am. And uh, we also have buying stations and offices and mills in all of the countries that we work in that produce coffee. So we have a quite a large office in Brazil. We have a trading office in Santos and buying centers and, and mills uh, about seven or eight inside Brazil as well. And you also have a podcast, right? We You're do. a podcaster team. We do have a podcast, yeah. So uh, it's as you know, it's a great way to reach people and, and to uh, communicate in a longer format. Uh, so uh, two of the traders that we have here, Mark Inman and Todd Mackey, are uh, our hosts. And between the two of them, they could probably forget more about coffee than I know. So it's a good podcast to listen to. It's called The Exchange with the Olam Specialty Coffee. Very so. good. It's If you're curious, especially to know a little bit about backstage of Olam mm -hmm. and Coffee Believes... Go and check, guys. I will leave the link in our post, in our website. So, Olon has huge departments in specialty and, and commercial coffee. Can you compare both towards thinking about Brazil? Sure. So... There's no getting around the fact that Brazil is, is the top producer of coffee. And as a result, because there's so much supply, um, there's a lot of demand for it. And, and traditionally in the United States, which is the market I'm most familiar with, uh, Brazil has been a major component of commercial grade coffee. And so that would be either consumer branded coffee, like the old brands like Folgers and Maxwell House, uh, or these days the sort of lower price tiered coffee. So Brazil has for a long time been a high volume but low price Uh, entrant in the U.S. market. Uh, with the Dawn specialty, there's been a new new understanding of Brazil coffee and, and a lot of countries it, since the creation of the specialty coffee market uh, have gone through a sort of image uh, redo. There's many countries where they were assumed to only have one type of coffee uh, and then it turns out they have lots of different kinds of coffee. Colombia is another noticeable notable example there. So when we look at Brazil, we look at it from two standpoints, from a high volume commercial standpoint still because there's a lot of that coffee and then we look at it from a differential standpoint coffees that are primarily traded not on their volume but on their uh, characteristics. So. During these 30 years of profession you heard all sort of things about Brazil, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in Dunkin' Donuts you have a large experience with commercial coffee. Mm -hmm. Can you tell how it was in the beginning? No, imagine you as a barista. Mm -hmm. You heard about Brazil and what did you listen about Brazil? When I started in specialty the, just the general thing you would hear somebody say is that if you're in specialty you don't buy Brazilian coffee. Begging your pardon, sir? Exactly. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact there is a book by Howard Schultz uh, where, you know, he He says it famously, he just, you know, when we started, we didn't buy Brazilian coffee, right? And and it was because there was this, this sort of just reputation that uh, nobody ever bothered to investigate. It just got passed along. Like, repu you know, sort of how reputations work, right? You know, somebody says something, people believe what they say, and then it just becomes truth over time. And uh, the thing that happened to me was was that I went to, I had to learn all about Brazilian coffee for uh, when I had the job uh, as the director of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. And uh, in the process of learning about Brazilian coffee, I learned all sorts of things, and I learned that most of what I knew about it was wrong. And so it, that changed a lot of things for me. That's why we're recording in English to share this knowledge about <laughs> Brazil, because Brazil is almost a continent. Mm. So we have more than 31 origins or regions or terroirs that are making completely different profiles of coffee. And now with the specialty coffee units where you're involved at Olam, 
how can you describe this evolving time to face Brazilian coffee? So first of all, one of the strengths of Brazil uh, in its coffee industry is its people. Uh, the people that work in the industry are, are um, very resourceful and uh, very innovative. And one of the outputs of that is the ability to produce any type of product very consistently. And there are people who are in specialty who think consistency isn't important. But at the end of the day, coffee is food. And people, consumers love predictability and consistency in food, especially something that's associated with a routine, right? So every morning I get my cup of coffee at this place and when it's too different, they feel upset, right? And so Brazil coffee has always been able to provide that consistency because the coffee industry in Brazil is very just technological. Warm. Yeah, technological. It's um, it's very systems oriented. It's uh, it's very sophisticated. Even back uh, 50 years ago, it was more sophisticated than it was any place else. So now that's a strength. And so how do we take that strength, the ability to produce high volumes of coffee very consistently, and then translate that into the specialty world? And so that's really been the focus of uh, my work with Brazilian coffee here is how do we take those strengths and leverage them to clients? And so that brings us to a place where uh, most roasters, even the specialty roasters, they have house blends, they have, you, you'll usually find that anyone who's roasting for wholesale or for grocery or for restaurants, they have most of their coffee tied up in two or three blends. And then they have small amounts of really special coffees that they put around the side of that. And I think we've done a good job is showing these roasters that uh, Brazil has a very key place to play in those blends. Uh, in high quality, differentiated specialty blends because it provides stability, it's available, it has a long shipment period, it can be very consistent, it's a good price, and it adds flavors uh, that can't be added from other coffees. And so that's been the basis for our specialty program, growing that volume, creating that interest, uh, creating that, um, that sort of permission and safety from a specialty roaster to say, hey, I buy a lot of Brazilian coffee and it's really beneficial to me. So for this specialty unity, are you doing micro lots or for blends or both? We're doing in the range. So we have a, a product uh, that we call Eagle. It's an Olam branded Brazil product. It's blended from different uh, producers in Mojian. Uh, Alto Mogiana, and we sell a lot of that as a blend component for the specialty industry. And then we will sell single estate coffees. So we have many different estates that we work with that we and we always put the producer names directly on those so that the consumers and Can the you give examples? But we're doing a lot of individual estate coffees through our Cafe Dallas program, which are mostly female producers. And uh, that's one of those things where um, every time we find a good one, we add them to our, our roster and we usually have... We try and also create relationships between the roaster and the um, producer so that they uh, know each other and that they have um, visibility into what... what the, the producer knows what the roaster is doing with their coffee and the roaster knows where their coffee is coming from. And When you say the producers are sophisticated, people might get the wrong image thinking it means rich. No, they are really creative, but it doesn't mean that they have lots of money to spend in innovations. Actually, they need to be creative to surpass those challenges. Correct, yeah. I think, um, you know, in Brazil, you have big agro-producers. You have, you know, highly mechanized, lots of capital, a lot of infrastructure on one side, and then you have smallholders who are uh, in a country where that's the norm, where, you know, that's the... the perceived as the cost of doing business is really low and so in order to be successful in that environment you do have to be very creative and very resourceful so and uh, and I think that what I found from smallholders in Brazil is they have learned all the best tricks they can from the big guys but then they put their own flavor on it so exactly yes when did your lunch started working with Brazilian coffee so do you remember their year I want to say 2006. Uh, I could be wrong by a year or two, but uh, we established a, a commercial operation for commercial grade coffee in Brazil in 2000, I think around 2006. It's been one of our main origins ever since. We actually own a, uh, our own estate in Brazil as well, but uh, we have become one of the top traders of Brazil coffee as a result of setting up that operation. So we've been a large commercial player in Brazil basically since then. We established our specialty business about three, four years ago. Can you mention volume uh, in 2006 and now to compare? I mean, I can I can say that we're consistently in the top three exporters. Okay. Um, I'm not really sure I, should, I have the right info on, on all the volumes. But, That's yeah. okay. And three years, you started Specialty Unity. Yeah. Why in first place and how does it go? Sure. So when I joined Olam, which is about five years ago, we didn't have much of a specialty Brazilian position and wasn't so much of a actively not wanting to have it as much of a 
we had people who had expertise in other origins and they had spent their time on those things. And having, it's a chicken and egg in that if you have coffee, there's you can create demand <laughs> for it. If you don't have, but if no one's asking for it, you're not necessarily going to buy it. So you have, you know, sometimes the way that you solve that is to just break the egg. And so I knew a lot about Brazilian coffee and I was comfortable with uh, being able to sell it. So I uh, went to Brazil during my sort of uh, orientation period, spent some time. We have a very talented uh, quality team down there and put together some uh, with the head of QC in our Brazil lab uh, who had several sort of profiles all already set up. We worked together on one, brought a few uh, lots of it into the United States, quick sell, uh, and then we're able to sort of go back and say, all right, now let's work on scaling this up, put a name to it, create a logo, started, you know, really professionalizing it and, uh, you know, fast forward to uh, today and it's one of the top coffees that we sell. Oh my God. So you were the crazy guy who said, let's sell specialty coffee from Brazil. Yeah. I, that's not the only reason I'm a crazy guy, but yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I imagine that the effort or the energy that you had to invest to convince the big guys in Olam. Yeah, I think they were... Olam is a great company because they're very interested in um, doing new things. So they don't necessarily need to be talked into taking risks. They just want them to explain to them, right? And to also want somebody who's going to champion it. So I was happy to be the champion, uh, as well as there are people in our Brazil operation who are very happy to champion them. And um, so they brought some people into their organization to be champions on that side. So um, I work with uh, some great people on, on my Brazil team, like Raul Banca and um, Daniela um, Cardoso. And... Uh, We've been able to sort of create a, a system where we look after the coffee at every stage. And customers, that matters. that's really what matters the most to customers. It's sort of like the, there's a lot of good things about Brazilian coffee, but if we don't deliver, then it, it doesn't matter. So uh, creating a system where we can deliver what we say we're going to do on time, that really matters. And we've been able to do that. So that's good. Looking at the perspective, so you were used to commercial Brazilian coffee in Dennis and then you come to Alain, you work two years and then you thought, let's try specialty Brazilian. Mm -hmm. this, this is the, okay. And when you started studying about or getting in touch with specialty Brazilian coffee, what were the main preconceptions that you saw you were wrong? Can you name five? No, I don't know. That I, I think the other thing that's been interesting is there has been an evolution in the industry. The BSCA, Brazilian Specialty Coffee Association, has done a good job representing Brazil at trade shows and in international forums. So they've done a lot on their side to change preconceptions. The other thing that's really happened is there's this uh, system of cupper training and certification called the Q grading system. And one of the component coffees in the exam is Brazil coffee. So if you want to become a professional specialty coffee taster, you have to become fluent with Brazil coffees. And in the process of doing that, you erase all the preconceptions because there's great coffees available in Brazil. So that's been a huge moment as well. Um, and I think also travel to Brazil has become a lot easier. Uh, it used to, just, used to just be too far and they didn't know enough people. And now there's so many different producers and exporters that are trying to get buyers to Brazil that there's been enough people who have gone and seen it and told their friends that it's, you know, so... It's less of a um, getting over preconceptions and more of just exposure and really, you know, there's a lot of demands on a specialty buyer's time and there's a lot of coffees that get put in front of them in terms, you know, try this from Kenya and try this from Guatemala and try this from Indonesia. And so um, I think the missing piece for us was helping a roaster understand where Brazil coffee would fit in their portfolio and why they needed it and why it would be valuable to them. And uh, so that's really been the journey. A long journey, three years already. Yeah. Do you speak Portuguese? No, I speak a little Portanhol. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I uh, learn a Portuguese word, it directly Directly subtracts from my Spanish, so <laughs> we understand. Don't yeah. worry. And what is your favorite region in Brazil for our coffee? For coffee, I mean, I have spent the most time in uh, Mogiana, um, and of course, you know, all through Minas Gerais, I, I've just really enjoyed. Although, the I think the part that I've most recently fallen in love with has been Espírito Santo. I've just really uh, found amazing coffees there, and just very different environment than I see in the rest of Brazil. A um, lot more innovation. Not not lots of machinery. Not lots of machinery. A lot of, of creative people um, and just a really good uh, vibe. So it's uh, it's a place I look forward to going back to. If you're listening to this episode, I recorded another episode in English mm -hmm. talking about Espírito Santo. Mm -hmm. So I will leave the link in our website in this episode. How do you see the Brazilian scenario in the next five years? Yeah, really good. I, I think that, 
you've got a couple of situations. First of all, I mean, from a macro standpoint, most buyers who buy, you know, at, at our level at volume are more interested in, in Brazil's Real than they are in their coffee uh, because it changes the price of coffee globally. And, and so, you know, we all become amateur weather forecasters and politician, you know, political scientists, right, trying to understand uh, what will go on in Brazil. So that's the sort of top level area. And then uh, when we look at Brazil supply, we think if they're producing enough, it will have an impact uh, both on prices and demand. Uh, because if the large roasters are satisfied, then, you know, that has one impact on small roasters. And if they're not satisfied, they'll come after what the small roasters have, you know, so we have to sort of make sure the overall demand balance uh, is taken care of. But at the end of the day, Brazil, there is no coffee country in my mind that's more poised for success than Brazil. So uh, it's redefined the landscape of how coffee is done. And, and so the important part now is consistency, good policy, just good access to capital and making sure that, you know, nothing backslides. Uh, usually when there's a little bit of success, that's when people who have usually have nothing to do with it get their hands in the middle of things. And so as long yeah. as the industry can remain independent and, and do what it's supposed to do, it should be good. Some people are with the price crisis. Mm -hmm. Some people are blaming Brazil efficiency. Mm -hmm. as producing lots of coffee. Mm -hmm. And my personal opinion, if you allow me, it's like we are the bad guys because we are smart, because we're investing in coffee science for more than 131 years. So what is your opinion about that? Yeah, I don't think blaming Brazilians for being efficient is an efficient <laughs> use of anyone's time. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's that story of, uh, you know, Steve Jobs, I think it was, who said, you know, if you had asked um, people uh, in the past how they wanted to, if how they could improve transportation, they would say faster horses, you know? I've been waiting for this. So Exactly. <laughs> so uh, I think that other countries have, there's plenty of opportunity for them to, to innovate uh, in terms of the human capacity is no less, the intelligence is no less, what is typically What is available in Brazil that is not available in a lot of other countries is uh, access to capital, uh, infrastructure from a from a country standpoint, and good policy. Um, and so Brazil has done those things reasonably well. And uh, all markets are efficient, and they will always uh, reward efficiency. So I don't. I think that's the last thing I would blame. Brazil is, is not even on my top 10 of reasons for the price crisis. So. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And about the Eagle project, mm -hmm. it's like a high quality product that you guys are offering. Can mm -hmm. you describe when it started? Do you do the SCA protocol of grades? How does it work? Sure. So it's a, it's a coffee that we really try and keep at SCAA 82 points and above, 80 being the minimum threshold for specialty. Um, but we want it to be a value product. We don't want it to be, you know, really high expensive micro lot type of pricing. So uh, because we want it to be a blend component. But the most important thing is stability. We buy from a finite group of farmers in, in the region and they um, produce a very clean, very high quality, but also uniform product. And so if you're using that in your blend, you can rely on us to every container we deliver, it's going to be the same flavor profile. So you can have fresh coffee in your blend basically year round as we, uh, because every container has the same uh, quality characteristics. And that is really valuable to roasters because it allows them to plan, it allows them to project forward. Um, and so we put our logo on it and we put a name on it because we wanted it to be easy to remember and, okay. um, and just something that people associate with us in terms of it being, um, you know, quality and value and consistency. And, you know, if, if uh, we're producing that and people are seeing our name associated with that, that's helpful to us, right? But uh, at the end of the day, it's really about what the farmers do and they, they do it really well. Do you have single estates we in do. this project? Yeah, we do. Uh, so I can do a single estate from Mojiana and out of the Eagle project, but really what uh, we've tried to do is find um, coffees from estates where the product maybe is, is distinctive but not repeatable. So they might have different types of flavors every year, but they have something special. Um, and when we do that, uh, then, you know, we sort of open up who that farmer is to our roasters. And we, you know, say, okay, this is an estate. These are the people. Um, this is what they do. This is how they started. This is their values. And, and these, you know, these are all the things that you can tell your customers about. Um, and we try and do more and more of that. The more we do that, the, the more we are truly in specialty. So that's a, a big goal for us. And it's easier to sell, right? It is. Uh, roasters need stories, right? At the end of the day, any roaster can buy any coffee. So what really matters is uh, how they attract their customers to them. And they attract their customers to them through marketing and stories and, and relationships. Do you think you will sell very soon coffee from Espirito Santo? Yeah, I actually have sold. Uh, actually, the best micro lot we've ever tasted came from Espirito Santo. So, wow. Yeah. This year, this harvest? Uh, last year. 
So yeah, it was really good. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm always on the lookout for those those coffees. I mean, at the end of the day, I still do everything blind. I don't look at names. I don't look at, I mean, I'm, I'm truly look, when I'm looking, especially when I'm looking at micro lots, I'm looking for the best. If it's great, then I'll turn the card over and say, okay, how much does this cost? Where is it from? Those kinds of things. But if it's not, the card stays over. So. Can I say that on a table, blind table, some Brazilian coffees had better results than Africans? Yeah, I mean, you can always, you're always surprised. Thank you! There's, Ooh. <laughs> you're always surprised. There's, there's been, there's been, uh, I never, you know, I've been tasting coffee a long time and I never say anything with surety if I don't know all the information because, you know, I, I'm 100% sure that this is one thing and then it's another and it's because the especially the world is changing so so quickly. There's so many different experiments going on with processing and varietals and different types of, you know, just innovative things that people are doing that, you know, I have tastes and I'm like, oh, this has to be this. And then it's turns out that it's something else and uh, which I enjoy. I mean, I don't, I'm not frustrated it's by that fun, at all. It's fun, yeah. It's uh, super fun, yeah, yeah. And where is our team located in Santos? Uh, yeah, we're, we are, our main office is in Santos, um, just across from the uh, Bolsa. And, nice. Uh, yeah, and um, then we have uh, mills in, um, we have a big mill in Alfenas and uh, a few others in, in various uh, coffee producing regions. So Alfenas is in Minas Gerais State. Mm -hmm. And Santos, for those who are not aware, Santos is just a city where there is the biggest port in the country and it's the exit of Brazilian coffee. I always say this because some people say, I would like some Santos coffee, believing that Santos is the name of a state or I don't know. So I, I record another podcast called What You Should Know About Brazilian Coffee. I highly recommend you to listen to that too. So Brazilian producers who are listening our conversation right now, they are from other origins. How can they contact your team to show their coffees? Um, so my strong recommendation is to is to deal with our specialty team in Santos. Coming directly to me is just going to have me send them back to them. Right? Really, we are very strongly aligned. Our two teams. Um, we spend a lot of time traveling back and forth. They've come here. We we go there. Um, we cup together all the time. We exchange samples all the time. They know what I'm looking for, and I um, make sure to know what they have. Right. And so working with them, a you can do it in Portuguese. B they'll tell you what demand there is for it, and uh, be able to sort of do all the local things. And then if, and then as I'm looking for coffee, they'll be able to say, Rob, we have this and this and this. And they also work with our... The other thing is if you come directly to me, you're cutting off uh, other opportunities. Our Brazil team not only works with our US team, but they work with our UK team. They work with our Europe team. I they wor see. work with our Asia team. And so they're able to offer those coffees globally. So... Interesting. Yeah. And I'll leave the address and the email in our website. Great. Thank you. To finalize conclusions, mm -hmm. what would you say to international buyers about Brazilian coffee now, 2019? What would I say to, to international buyers? I, I mean, I think the ones that know already know. Uh, the issue is is if you haven't, if you're still stuck in a mode where you think that Brazilian coffee is just commercial grade coffee, you're really missing out. Um, there's plenty of commercial coffee for sure, but uh, that's only half the story. And you know, anyone who's been to Brazil will tell you that aside from people being very friendly, they're also very motivated and innovative. So if you want something, you can get it. There's there's never a place where I'm more sure that I can ask for something and, and someone will find a way to do it for me than Brazil. And so if you're a buyer, you should be uh, you should be going to a place like that because if you're not, you're missing out. For buyers who never bought Brazilian coffee, mm -hmm. what would be your tips to start with? Call an importer and ask them to send you a, a spread of samples. And again, go through the through the range of qualities, right? Um, one of the things that, that a trap that new buyers of specialty coffee fall into is they assume that everything has to be the best of the best of the best, right? And uh, if it's not the best, I'm not interested, right? And you're, you know, A, life doesn't work that way, but B, you're, you're sort of doing it wrong because that's not how it works. Every coffee has a home and every coffee has, has a purpose. And even within the specialty business, it is still a business. And within the business part of it, you have to sell products to consumers at a profit, right? And so it means you need a variety of products and you need to do a variety of things with them. And Brazil is such a versatile coffee that can work in a low cost blend and work in a high end micro lot that um, it's one of those things that you're a, you're a better buyer if you're familiar with all your tools, right? And you know, I've done some podcasts and seminars on coffee buying. And one of the things that I would say when I'm talking about skills for buyers is you, you know, being a great cupper is, you know, not even step one. 
It's, it's about having experience with the range of all the coffees that are out there and knowing what to do with them. And so um, leaving off Brazil is sort of like leaving a hammer out of your toolbox. So. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and are you open, for example, I'm not sure you personally are Olam, to buy fine Robustas and Conilans? We buy uh, commercial and fine. The market for that in the U.S. is pretty small, uh, for, just to be honest. I mean, there's not, we don't see a lot of demand for that. There's not even for blends? Yeah, not even for blends. It's just um, it's mostly an Arabica market here, uh, but in Europe, uh, it's actually pretty big. So that's more of the focus for that. Are you personally interested? Me? Yes. Uh, I'm interested in what I want to drink and what I can sell. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being honest. Yeah. So I'd rather have a nice uh, uh, Michael Lap from Espirito Santo. <laughs> Spirito Santo is producing lots of fine conilon as well. Yeah. Last question, and then mm -hmm. if you are open mm -hmm. for final considerations. The last question is, what are Olam's projects towards Brazil in the next five years? Yeah, so we continue to expand our presence there. We just built a fairly large mill, and, and we'll continue to do that as, as needs arise. Uh, from the specialty side, one exciting project that we just Uh, implemented is we built a uh, cupping and buying truck and so we drive around Brazil. Uh, That's cool. Yeah, and it's got a full-on roaster and cupping lab inside the truck, and we go out to where the coffee is, and we, and we uh, we do training and we do uh, exhibition cuppings, but we also do just to buy. We like look, look taste the coffee right there, and then decide if we want to buy it. That kind of work we're going to do more and more of. Uh, it started already, or no? It's already started. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and uh, bringing more buyers to Brazil, having more uh, informative trips and sessions, doing more exposure of, of coffees, um, being more direct with producers, more um, marketing of who those producers are directly to our clients so that, um, and then our clients marketing them directly to consumers. It's not just the future, it's it's really, I mean, people are really interested in their food and they want to know where it comes from. Yes. And coffee should be no different. It should be a, a strong part of that since almost everybody drinks coffee every day. So I think just more things that um, create more uh, connection and more um, sort of specialized value added process to what we do. So. Very nice. Any final considerations about Brazilian coffee? I think, you know, you should drink it and you'll you'll see what it's about. Um, I also just highly recommend anyone who's got the opportunity to go to Brazil. It's it's one of my favorite places. And uh, oh, um, I uh, can't wait to get back to Tombo Beach. So <laughs> <laughs> I love this beach. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Are you coming for the next harvest? I hope to come down this year, yeah. I usually come down around, uh, say, September, October. So. Thank you very much for your time, for your knowledge, for your perspective. Thank you. It's a great opportunity. Thanks. Thanks.